If it's Thursday, chaos inside the House Republican conference as Speaker McCarthy basically dares his members to hold a vote to oust him as Speaker, as the divisions within the Republican Party may force the government to shut down. Plus, the Hunter Biden legal saga deepens, with the special counsel indicting the president's son on three felony gun counts tied to a gun purchase, just as President Biden tries to refocus his re-election campaign on the economy. And a courtroom drama so big it can't even fit in the courtroom. The trial for two of Trump's co-defendants will officially begin next month in Georgia, as the judge tries navigating an historic courtroom proceeding on live television. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Garrett Hake reporting in Washington, where the mess facing House Speaker Kevin McCarthy on Capitol Hill has gotten even messier, if that was even possible, as he tries to quell a brewing rebellion amid an impeachment inquiry and a government funding fight. Divisions between Speaker McCarthy and the conservative wing of his conference reached a new low point this morning in an incredibly tense closed-door meeting. So what's going on here? A faction of ultra-conservative House Republicans is pushing the conference towards a government shutdown while threatening McCarthy's speakership if their demands to slash government spending aren't met. McCarthy dared his detractors to try and remove him as speaker, according to two sources in the room, telling members, and I quote, if you want to file a motion to vacate, then file the effing motion. The speaker admitted his evident frustration to reporters following the meeting. I showed frustration in here because I am frustrated with the committee. I am frustrated with some people in the conference. But when we come back, we're not going to leave. We're going to get this done. Nobody wins in a government shutdown. Nobody wins in a government shutdown. I've been here. I knew people would fight or try to hold leverage for other things. I'm going to continue to just to focus on what's the right thing to do for the American people. And you know what? If it takes a fight, I'll have a fight. This all comes after McCarthy struggled to get his caucus to agree to what should be the most non-controversial spending bill of all, funding the military. McCarthy had to scrap the vote last night due to protests from his far-right flank that weren't even tied to military funding. Today, following that fiery closed-door meeting, some Republican lawmakers commiserated with McCarthy's frustration and criticized their colleagues. The Republicans would be stronger if we were united on the appropriations bills. I have not heard many members describe to me what is wrong with the DOD bill. Per some members are pretty honest that they're holding this for leverage. Uh, I don't think that's the appropriate tactic. I think the, 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 the Speaker's frustration is unique uh, because he has done everything they've asked. Uh, and made every commitment. You probably know that the speaker said, look, if, if you want to make a motion to vacate the uh, chair, bring it on. I think he was very clear that uh, uh, he's not concerned from a standpoint of those, uh, those claims. He's concerned from a standpoint of making sure that we fund the government. Despite the backlash and McCarthy's dare to put up or shut up, some holdouts show no signs of budging on the funding fight, despite what appears to have been an attempt at a political olive branch by the Speaker to conservatives in announcing that impeachment inquiry into President Biden. But instead, the conservative wing of the party seems more emboldened now than placated. The result? There is no good path forward for McCarthy ahead of the government funding deadline. On one side, he has a ticked-off conservative wing still bitter over this spring's debt deal. And the other side, ticked-off Democrats who now seem even less likely to help bail McCarthy out after his green lining of an impeachment inquiry into President Biden. McCarthy appears stuck, and the clock is ticking. Joining me now is my NBC News colleague on the Capitol Hill team, Ali Vitale. And Ali, you've been chasing this around all day. We heard some of the fireworks from the House Republicans this meeting. But yeah. beyond the F word, and I don't mean frustration, what was McCarthy's <laughs> broader message to his conference today? <laughs> Well, I mean, other than saying put up or shut up, it was clear that he wants to try to move forward with some kind of a continuing resolution or resolving these spending problems outright. They're going home for the weekend now, but when they come back, they really do have a sprint to the finish line here. I think what strikes me so much, though, as you and I are covering these dynamics up here on Capitol Hill, is we've seen McCarthy at these pinch points before between the House Freedom Caucus and other members of his conference, the ways that he can get a deal in bipartisan fashion and the ways that he can placate 
implicate the more conservative members of his conference. It feels like in moving forward with an impeachment inquiry, we're now squarely in the story if you give a mouse a cookie, because what we're seeing from these Freedom Caucus members is they'll take the crumb of an impeachment inquiry, but they still want more concessions from their speaker, and they're still looming over him with that idea of a motion to vacate. I think I've heard from several sources today who were happy to hear McCarthy, however exasperated and colorful his language was behind closed doors, say, if you're going to do it, if you're going to oust me, just oust me, and they'll do that battle when that battle comes. It's clear, though, that Gates is happy to keep his powder dry until he's ready to move on his own motion to vacate. But I think what's clear for these conservative members is what we've always known to be true about this conference, which is when you're working with margins of three or four, and we are looking at shifting numbers just because of some unforeseen absences, mm -hmm. when you've got everyone who can be a playmaker, they're going to try to make plays. Around this time yesterday, we were watching the House pull the vote on the defense funding bill. How much yeah. is that about the defending fund funding bill, and how much is that about McCarthy's trust problems within the conference or some of these other issues? Yeah, it's as much as impeachment has to do with government funding. All of these things are related, but they're not exactly clear how they're related when you put them down on paper. It's obvious, though, if Republicans are having trouble passing military spending and funding bills, that there are larger issues at play here. We saw on the Senate side even today some people holding up the process, including Rand Paul and a handful of other senators, holding up this process because they say that voting on a minibus or a package of those few spending bills that involve of military spending among them would basically neutralize their ability to cut spending on the other nine funding bills that are also at play here. And so we're watching them all try to play a game of leverage, not just in the House, where they're trying to hold McCarthy's job hostage in addition to the concessions on spending that they want, but we're also seeing them get some backup in the Senate. And I think the thing that I keep thinking of here is that people like Senator Mike Lee, Senator Rick Scott, they are very close to the Freedom Caucus. They're in completely different chambers, but they've got the same goal here. And, Ali, is there any chance that Democrats throw McCarthy some kind of lifeline here, or are they perfectly happy to watch him struggle till the end of the month? I have not heard from any Democrat that could have thrown him a lifeline or that had been open to throwing him a lifeline in months prior. I've not heard that from them today. I think that what we're watching with Democrats is them continue to be happy in the minority in that they are watching Republicans make a mess of this all on their own, and they're going to allow them to do that. I think that where that comes to be a problem is the fact that Democrats have prided themselves, and McCarthy tried to use this in his closed-door meeting today, Democrats have prided themselves on being the adult in the room, willing to stay step in and work in bipartisan fashion if it's to avert a debt ceiling or fund the government. This gives them that opportunity, and that's one of McCarthy's messages today to his conference, which was, why hand them a win when we could all work this out amongst ourselves? That kind of fell on deaf ears, but we'll see if that's the same when they come back to town next week. All right, Ali Vitale, thank you for that reporting. And joining me now is Louisiana Republican Congressman Mike Johnson. He's the vice chair of the House Republican Conference. So, Congressman, you just heard Ali Vitale there. How do Republicans show that you can be the adults at the room and not let the lights shut off across the country with a shutdown at the end of this month? What's the plan out of this as we sit here now on Thursday afternoon? Well, I think Ali said it well. We will work this out amongst ourselves. And in spite of all the sens sens sensation of this on the Hill today, sorry, it's been a long day. I hear you. Um, I, I think that the conference is really not that far apart. Look, we all want the same things, whether you're Freedom Caucus or you're from a district that uh, President Biden won. All Republicans want the same things. We want lower spending. We want the border secured. We want to root out corruption in federal agencies. There's a path to get there. There's a lot of different opinions on how to do it, but we still have time. I, I think that we're headed to a continuing resolution, and I think that'll allow us time to get the appropriations bills done, and I think we'll work this out. I mean, the, on the appropriations bills, it seems like you are in a position now, and correct me if our reporting is wrong on this, but you don't have agreement on the top line number across the board. I thought that was supposed to be solved in the debt ceiling deal. If you're not there now, are we moving backwards on getting closer to actually funding the government? Uh, I don't think so. I, I mean, there's been a lot of discussion about those numbers, um, FY22 levels, FY23. We did think we had some of that resolved. But I think we'll get back to the main point. I, I don't think anyone here desires a government shutdown. It's bad news, as the speaker said for everybody. And, you know, I, I come from a district that has uh, large military installations. I want to make sure our mm -hmm. service members are paid. You know, we're, we're going to work towards this. We'll stay here as long as we have to next week and make sure that the, the job is done. And I'm, I'm confident that we'll get it done. 
Uh, you know as well as I do that staying there through the weekend, while it might force people to work together, it's going to bring some of that friction right to the surface. I mean, the speaker was very clear about his frustration today. Do you share that frustration with members of your conference? I mean, how do you push these people? And, and, and who are they who you see is kind of in the way of getting this done? Well, look, there are lots of opinions here. Um, I have some very good friends involved on both sides of, of these issues. Uh, but they're all here in good faith. They're all trying to do the right thing. And, and they're trying to ensure that the end goal is met. Again, reducing spending, closing the border, et cetera. Um, the, the reality is we have, it's a math issue, right? I mean, this is the reality of politics. I've been in the legislative arena for a long time and understand that if you don't have the votes, you can't move all of your priorities all at once. And I think that that reality is going to set in here very quickly. And I think we're going to get some very good legislation. It's not going to be ideal. It's not going to be our dream legislation and everything that we want. Want, but we've got to win another election cycle and win the majority in the other chamber to get all that done in the White House ultimately. So is it, I, mean, I think that reality is going to set in. Is it worth putting something like the defense bill on the floor and sort of forcing the issue and, and, and holding a vote on it as opposed to waiting to make sure you've got everything locked down? Well, it's not my preference, but it may come to that. Um, we have to get the job done one way or the other, and, and uh, that's something that is being suggested and talked about. It will be talked about in earnest over the weekend, and, and we'll see what's decided. Um, the Senate has been moving, you know, quickly in Senate terms on working through their appropriations bills. They're doing it in a bipartisan way. How concerned are you? I know the speaker wants to ultimately end up in a conference committee and kind of hash this out with the Senate in that way. But if you guys don't get your own bills passed and all you can do is a CR and kind of hold the line until some later date, that these House priorities will get steamrolled by Senate Democrats and Senate Republicans who have agreement where you lack it. Well, we have to ensure that that doesn't happen. But, I mean, I'll say this in general. It is easier to pass appropriations bills if you're plussing up, if you're spending more money. The hard part, the principled part, in my view, is to try to bring this spending under control. It's harder to reduce spending than it is to spend more, obviously. So we commend the Senate for doing their job and getting appropriations bills done, but it's not what we all agreed should happen and what the country desperately needs. We're, you know, we're drowning in debt. I mean, we have almost $32 trillion in debt, and it's a very dangerous time to be in debt because our adversaries around the world are being very aggressive. You know, uh, uh, that is uh, directly related to national security. So the threats are great, and the hour is late, and we understand that. And I think we need adults in the room to sit down and work this out. That that's the beauty of this process, as messy yeah. as it is sometimes. That's how the founders intended for it to work at the end of the day. Congressman, I think this, members of the Senate would say they are, you know, holding up their end of the bargain here. They're operating within the structure of that debt limit deal. I think they're the ones saying that the House isn't. But I want to move on and talk about the other big story from the House side of the, of the chamber this week, the impeachment inquiry. Um, the Speaker launching this this week, basically unilaterally, not having a vote. When Democrats unveiled their articles of impeachment in 2019, you put out a statement that says, in part, the founders of this country feared a single-party impeachment because it would be bitterly and perhaps irreparably divide our nation. Nancy Pelosi and her radical lieutenant simply don't care. This will backfire on them politically, but it will do serious harm to America in the process. Do those same maxims apply right now as House Republicans, as just one party, appear to be inching towards impeaching the president? Yes, I would, I would issue the same exact tweet right now because impeachment Next to the declaration of war, I mean, impeachment is, is the, the, the heaviest power that the Congress has, and the sole power of impeachment, according to Article 1, Section 2 of the Constitution, is with the House. So it can't be wielded for political purposes. And that's what we were accusing the Democrats of doing against Donald Trump. That is not what is at issue here. And I've gone to great pains to explain this. To everyone who will listen, we are following evidence, and we have a constitutional responsibility to do so. Because if you look at Article 2, Section 4, it says that the president, a president, shall be impeached, I mean, shall be removed from office uh, on impeachment of and conviction for treason, bribery, high crimes, and misdemeanors. The evidence that's come forward that, that has been developed in all these investigations over eight or nine months now shows very clearly that we have serious allegations of some of those categories of infractions. And the, there's a, the Constitution says we must do that, we have to follow the truth where it leads. There's a big difference between allegations and evidence, though. You sure. have allegations. Do you have the evidence of those things? We, we have a lot of evidence. I mean, we, we have, uh, you know, bank statements. We have uh, text. We have emails. We have whistleblowers from the IRS and the FBI who have come forward and, and testified under oath. We have, we have mounds of this evidence, and, and it is incumbent upon us. We have a duty under the Constitution to follow it. Look, I take no pleasure in this. Impeaching a president is a 
is a huge thing for the country. It's not something that should be handled uh, lightly, and it's not. And I assure you that the people on the committees of jurisdiction that are doing this investigation are doing it with a heavy heart. This is not, we take no pleasure in this. I don't want to impeach a president, but that's where the evidence seems to be going. If we, if we, the inquiry having now been started, if we gather the remaining documents and there's evidence that exonerates President Biden, then so be it. That's where it will be done. But we will have done our duty under the Constitution. It's a very serious matter. Congressman, we're almost out of time, but just quickly, the speaker is right that in 2019, Speaker Pelosi started that first impeachment of uh, President Trump without a vote, but they did ultimately have a vote as they moved further along and uncovered more evidence. Do you believe uh, the House needs to have a vote to formalize this impeachment inquiry to give you, folks like yourself on the Judiciary Committee the authority you need to move forward? Well, it's not required under the Constitution. It's very broad language in that, that Article One power, that the sole power of impeachment is with uh, the House, and th there's no Should prescription on how it's done. I think we'll ultimately probably have a vote, but I'm just saying it's not legally required. And the, and the, the district court in D.C. has actually ruled on that in recent years. So um, it, 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 it may be a good measure, but it's not necessary to proceed. All right, Congressman Mike Johnson, we've got to leave it there. I appreciate you coming on. Yes, sir. All right, up next, breaking news on Hunter Biden, the president's son indicted by special counsel David Weiss on multiple gun-related charges. But first, a special programming announcement. My friend and colleague, Kristen Welker, is officially taking the reins as Meet the Press moderator this Sunday, where she will have an exclusive interview with former President Trump. Believe me, you're not going to want to miss it. We'll be right back. You're watching Meet the Press now. And we're back with breaking news on the legal front. Just a short time ago, Hunter Biden, the president's son, was indicted in Delaware federal court on three federal gun charges. Two of those counts are related to forms Biden filled out while buying a gun in which he allegedly lied about his use of illegal drugs. The third charge is tied to his possession of a firearm while using a narcotic. This case is being overseen by special counsel David Weiss, whose plea deal with Hunter Biden on similar charges fell apart in July after the judge presiding over the case raised questions about some of the details of that agreement. Now, this may not be the end of Hunter Biden's legal troubles either. When asked if the president's son could face additional charges or indictments, a spokesperson for the special counsel responded, quote, the investigation continues. Joining me now is NBC News Justice and Intelligence Correspondent Ken Delanian. And also with me is former U.S. Attorney Carol Lamb, who's now an NBC News legal analyst. So, Ken, the original plea deal dealt with tax charges, too. Is there any indication we could see additional charges soon on those or on other counts? Well, the best indication we heard from David Weiss is his spokesperson saying the investigation continues, although he said that when he was uh, negotiating that and, and announcing that plea deal that mm -hmm. fell apart with Hunter Biden that got us here. Specifically with the tax charges, it's hard to imagine that the prosecution would negotiate a deal where Hunter Biden agreed to admit to misdemeanor tax charges and then, when that deal fell apart, not bring any tax charges whatsoever. I think the real question is whether the prosecution will bring more serious tax charges than just the misdemeanors, potential felonies. And if they do that, uh, it would likely be in Los Angeles or in Washington, D.C., Garrett. So, Carol, the charges against Hunter Biden do look very similar to the charges that he'd agreed to plead guilty to a couple of months ago. Is today's indictment just another step towards another plea deal? I mean, he's functionally admitted to these acts by being at, literally at the doorstep of accepting the plea deal previously. We, we certainly don't know whether this is simply a placeholder because the statute of limitations was about to expire or whether ongoing plea negotiations are taking place. I think it's a little bit of both. At this point, David Weiss, the special counsel, has to be prepared to go in either direction. He has to be prepared to indict probably both the tax counts and this, this firearms case that he has now indicted. And he always has to have an open mind towards uh, the possibility of a resolution through some, some type of plea deal. Whether it's a plea deal that is exactly like the one that we saw before or whether it's one that will result in some harsher sanctions on Hunter Biden remains to be seen. It does go towards the fact that prosecutors generally feel that the longer it takes to reach a resolution with a defendant, the harsher the penalties are going to be. So in other words, the sooner you, you come in the door to cut a deal, the better off you are. They don't like to set the precedent of somebody hanging on till the very end and then getting what they call a sweet deal. So that remains to be seen. But uh, we haven't seen any indication that the tax charges are going away. I will say that tax counts 
are a lot more complicated than firearms cases, generally speaking. And so it doesn't surprise me that it's taking longer for David Weiss to gather all the evidence and jump through all the hoops necessary to bring a good, solid tax case. To, to your point about the idea of hanging on till the end and getting a sweetheart deal, does the fact that this previous plea deal collapsed make it more or less likely the government would be willing to enter into another plea deal with the same defendant? You know, I, I have to say that was such an unusual occurrence. I think it really caught everybody off guard to see a very high profile case like that go into court and then have the plea deal fall apart it was very, very unusual. And I think everybody uh, has to take some responsibility for that. It's not just Hunter Biden's attorneys uh, who should take responsibility. It's also the government. The fact that they went into court and it only took a couple of questions from the judge to make it clear that there wasn't a complete meeting of minds between the government and mm -hmm. the defendant, um, I think means that everybody's accountable for that. So it, it wouldn't necessarily surprise me if they did come up with a deal that was similar to the last one, but I think they'll take some political heat for that. So it, it might get a little bit harsher. And if they don't, we're looking at another major trial coming up next year where, Ken, that may be where Donald Trump's trial in Georgia happens, right? We learned today that he's not going to stand trial in Georgia next month. Did anything in today's hearing in Georgia provide any clarity on when Donald Trump will go to trial in that state? I think it suggests it's going to be a long time, a year or more, Garrett, because, mm. you know, uh, the judge is moving forward with a trial in the fall with these two uh, defendants, Sidney Powell and Kenneth Chesbro, who uh, won their motion to sever themselves away from the rest of the group. But the judge has also said he thinks this trial could take eight months. And so, uh, and, and that's probably conservative. So just extrapolate that out. Right. Um, and then, and then you know, we know that Donald Trump is going to continue to push to delay. Other defendants are going to ask to sever and they may win. And there may be a second trial before Donald Trump faces justice in that case. So I think it's a long way uh, to go before we see Donald Trump in that courtroom as a defendant. Car uh, Carol, how big of an advantage is it for Donald Trump's defense team that they'll basically get to see all the arguments or many of the arguments that will be made against them in court made against two other defendants before they ever set foot in a, in a courtroom. Well, it is an advantage for Donald Trump's team because, of course, every time a witness testifies, you they give a version of the stories that may not be precisely the same as prior versions they've given, and you can sort of exploit those inconsistencies and discrepancies to suggest that their memory isn't perfect on that front. Um, however, they it is also an advantage candidly for the government because they also see how witnesses perform on the witness stand in front of juries and they get to fix up any weaknesses in their own examinations of the witnesses. So it's an advantage to both sides, generally speaking. Prosecutors tended to feel that it was a bit of a, an advantage to the prosecution to see the way a trial plays out because remember, you see not only how the witnesses testify on the stand, but you also see what the cross-examination is. Uh, even if they are other defendants, you get to see the type of cross-examination and how the witness answers those hostile questions. Ken, i got to go lightning round with you here for two more questions. We also learned some new details in the classified documents case in the last 24 hours. What are we learning about the documents found at Mar-a-Lago? Well, Judge Aileen Cannon has ruled that uh, it's... Based on her ruling, it's unlikely that Donald Trump gets his wish to be able to review the classified document evidence at his home at Mar-a-Lago. Remember, he had asked to do that in June. Um, she issued an order essentially setting a bunch of parameters that seemed to make that impossible. But what's interesting is the order came in September after a, a motion made in June, which is hmm. giving some observers pause about how quickly Judge Aileen Cannon is moving in that case, Gary. We're watching that one very closely. And lastly, Ken, you had some exclusive reporting on the pressures facing the prosecutor and the FBI agents who've been investigating the Hunter Biden case. Can you share that with us, please? Yeah, that's right. Some of those agents, particularly those who have been named by Republicans in Congress, have been subject to threats, and their families have as well. And it's so concerning, and the larger threat picture against FBI agents who have been investigating Donald Trump, so concerning that the FBI has had to set up a special unit of 10 people devoted exclusively to investigating and mitigating threats against the FBI. It's a really grim picture, Garrett. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. All right, Ken Delanian and Carol Lamb, thank you both. And coming up, nearly 150,000 auto workers are threatening to go on strike at midnight tonight in what could be a major economic and political headache for the president. You're watching Meet the Press now.
Welcome back. And hours after his son was indicted on three felony counts tied to his purchase of a gun, President Biden delivered remarks in Maryland on his administration's economic record. But his message could get further derailed, not just by the developments tied to his son, but by a potential strike by U.S. auto workers in less than eight hours. As the 2024 campaign ramps up, Biden is now shifting tactics, looking to draw a sharper contrast between his economic policy of Bidenomics versus what he calls Maganomics. Take a listen. Look, their plan, Maganomics, is more extreme than anything America has ever seen before. Just months ago, they went further than anyone has ever gone, threatening to default on the debt that's over 220 years old. Well, they're back at it again, breaking their commitment, threatening, threatening more cuts and threatening to shut down the government again this month. As Biden looks to reshape public perception around his handling of the economy, he has a steep hill to climb. A new USA Today in Suffolk poll shows that more Americans trust Trump to improve the economy than Biden. Joining me now from the White House is Ali Rafa, and Jay Gray is with us from Detroit. So, Ali, Biden often says, don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. But people are comparing him to the alternative, and they're liking the alternative better, at least according to that poll. What's the plan here? How do they make this economic message resonate? Yeah, Garrett, uh, President Biden unveiling his new term for that alternative that you quoted him on, uh, saying that Republicans' economic agenda uh, is called MAGAnomics. And he laid out the differences between MAGAnomics and Bidenomics. And it's a lot of the points that we've heard the White House and the president echo uh, for years now. But what's notable is how much the White House and the president, uh, they're relying on this economic message when they're re uh, campaigning for re-election, despite in poll after poll, it shows that the majority of Americans, uh, that this is just not sticking or resonating with them. The most recent of those polls, uh, take a look at this one here, showing more Americans say they trust former President Trump than the current president to fix the economy, the economy that the president is bragging about. So there's obviously a disconnect here. The White House has acknowledged that. But the White House's argument time and time again over the last few months has been just be patient, that eventually this gap will fill. And we'll start to see uh, that support for uh, the economic rebound that we've seen coming out of the pandemic. The big question now is how long it's going to take to see that shift, Garrett. Allie, uh, any reaction from the White House on the uh, Hunter Biden indictment? And should we expect any reaction from them? So unsurprisingly, no reaction from White House officials, the president, the, the vice president. Um, and that's really the posture that they've taken uh, whenever Hunter Biden's legal woes are in the news. They're saying that this is a, a personal legal matter. They're referring questions about this to the DOJ and Hunter's lawyers. Uh, one of Hunter's lawyers, his lead lawyer, actually commented on this in a statement earlier, saying this new indictment is, quote, uh, that it pre pre presents, rather, a grave threat to our system of justice. And and the White House and the president were expecting this, Garrett. Remember, prosecutors had said they planned to issue this indictment by the end of the month. But I think that preparation doesn't make this any uh, less of a sting for the White House and for the president. Remember, they thought this was all going to be wrapped up months ago with that plea right. deal for Hunter uh, that has since unraveled. And now you have this coming just two days after the president had uh, his own impeachment inquiry launched by Speaker McCarthy. Obviously, these two situations are very separate, that inqu inquiry uh, relating to uh, other matters than these charges. But regardless, it gives Republicans more political ammunition to use this against the president. So that shows no signs of wearing down soon. All right, Jay Gray with us from Detroit. Let's talk about this potential UAW strike. For folks who haven't been paying close attention to this up until now, what are the major sticking points to a deal with now just about eight hours to go until the deadline? Yeah, and Garrett, I should point out within the last 30, 45 minutes, I talked to one of the negotiators in the room, one of the union negotiators who said they still don't want to strike, but he also feels like it's almost inevitable at this point that the mm. strike will happen at midnight. Sticking points, pay obviously is a big one, but there are several other key points. Let's talk about it. First, the union asking for a 40 percent pay raise, 46 compounded over uh, four years. They also want better benefits, pension and retirement benefits. 
they're looking to end what they say is temporary labor, make those full employees. And they are also talking about a four-day work week, getting a, a full paycheck for a four-day work week. What the union has said is that uh, there's no way they can do all of that and remain in business. They have offered a reported 17 to 20 percent pay raise. They said the four-day work week is a non-starter, but mm -hmm. they have offered more vacation days, more personal days off, and they say that they will contribute more and help reshape the pension program. So they seem to be aligned on that, but still miles away, Garrett, when it comes to several of the other issues. Jay, we've got a couple of big Hollywood unions that are still on strike. The Teamsters narrowly avoided a strike. You're an everything yes. correspondent out there in the country covering all of these different issues. What have we learned this summer about the state of the labor movement in this country? Yeah, and health workers here in Detroit striking as well. Look, I think there's a lot of frustration, and, and it speaks to the general work environment. A lot of people uh, feeling the squeeze of everything, not only cars, but daily use items uh, going up and up and up with supply chain issues, and that's continued for two, two and a half years now. And a lot of employees will tell you they just don't feel like they're getting paid what they're worth. And specifically, when it comes to CEOs, to the those running the companies that they work for, and that's an issue with the automakers here. They say that they're unproportionately paid compared to what the executives are making. We hear it all the time. All right, Ali Rafa, Jay Gray, thank you both for your reporting. And still to come, we'll get another look inside Speaker McCarthy's contentious meeting with his members today. Republican Congressman Mike Waltz will be here on set after a quick break. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. We started the hour with the chaos on Capitol Hill this week as House Republicans have struggled to get the votes to avoid a government shutdown, all while juggling this new impeachment inquiry launched by Speaker McCarthy and the threats to oust him from leadership. There is so much news on this topic. We're going back to someone who has been in the thick of it. Joining me now is Florida Republican Congressman Mike Waltz. So, Congressman, you're on the Armed Services Committee. Yeah. I, this defense bill getting pulled the other night, how big of an issue is that? What does it tell us about the state of the Republican Party right now and your ability to govern? Yeah, look, I mean, I think there's a lot of people, me included, that believes we need to get our spending under, under control. There's all types of programs that are under threat of literally going uh, bankrupt with the amount of spending. Just to put it in perspective here, it, you know, we normally appropriate about $1.5 trillion per year. Uh, we've gone through $6 trillion uh, in the last two years. So I don't, any family, uh, w there's no family that would be able to spend four times uh, what they bring in. However, to your point on, on defense, we need to get that bill on the floor. I've encouraged Speaker McCarthy to go ahead and put it on the floor and say, you know what, Let's see. Let's let the chips fall where they may. Call we have for these look, exactly. We have a 30 percent mm -hmm. increase for junior enlisted soldiers. We should not have our military members going to food banks for God, for for God's sake. So let's you know. I think what people are doing is they're holding one thing hostage mm -hmm. for the broader issue. But first things first. Let's take care of our troops, and that's near and near to my heart, and we need to get it done. I understand your concerns about the spending levels, especially going back historically, but I think Democrats in the, in the White House and in the Senate look at this and say, we had a deal. We had a deal for these top-line spending numbers. Does it make House Republicans look unserious that that deal was almost immediately cut out from underneath them? Yeah, so you're getting into, I mean, you're getting into the weeds now on the, on really how that deal came about. Mm -hmm. It was to go back to FY22 levels. Right. Some conservatives think that the pulling back the COVID money is really a one-time thing right. and doesn't get us to a baseline to get our spending under control. That's the crux of the issue. Uh, and and I, I don't think we can lose the forest for the trees here and that we have to get our spending under control. We'll get there. It may be messy, but I do think we'll get there. I want to go back to the defense bill for a yeah. minute because Chuck Schumer was very critical of the way this has been handled on the Senate floor today. I want to play a little bit of what he said today. Sure. Listen. These days, the actions we see on the other side say more than all the patriotic rhetoric on earth. In the House, the Republicans can't even agree to debate a bill to, defund, to fund the Defense Department and the intelligence community. And they balk at providing emergency aid to a Democratic partner fighting off a Russian invasion. 
mean, you're a veteran. What do you make of his claims now that Republicans' rhetoric is just not lining up with your actions on the floor in control of the well, House? Well, Republicans have a long history of supporting our troops and supporting a strong national defense. I think in this case, it is two things clashing. One, uh, a group wanting a small group, but it mm -hmm. obviously an influential one given the size of our of our majority, wanting to get our spending out of control, spending under control. My position is let's not do that on the backs of our troops. There's a lot of other ways that 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 we can do that. Let's get the defense bill through. Let's defend uh, and 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 fully fund our border. Mm -hmm. uh, and then let's have that argument going forward. You, you've also been supportive of Ukraine. You were in Ukraine. You met with Zelensky. The, right. the uh, additional money being requested for Ukraine has become a huge flashpoint within your conference as well. How active is that discussion, is that argument, and about whether or not this money needs to be included? Yeah, right, right now, now we're on the, on, on the broader issue of mm -hmm. the overall spending. Not even there yet. That will, that will come. My problem with it is, is I think that's the kind of the worst flavor of politics to couple that with disaster aid that Americans need right now from California to Texas to Florida. Those should be two separate conversations. The White House are trying to link those together so that people that have concerns with Ukraine aid, they can then beat them up uh, for voting against disaster. I think you'll see those decoupled, number one. And then number two, on Ukraine, yes, I've been supportive. We should have done a lot more up front to mm -hmm. help Ukraine actually win rather than lose less lose, slowly. Lose more slowly. Yeah, or sure. use more slowly, right? Um, but what we need to see going forward, Garrett, is conditionality on that aid. And I think it's fair questions to say, what does success look like? What's the pathway to get there? Uh, th there needs to be some room between blank check, which is where the president is, and not another dollar, which is where uh, some others are. The Europeans need to step up and do more. Only nine of 31 NATO nations are living up to their 2% defense commitments. I want to see some leverage to get them to defend themselves and to defend Europe uh, and to help Ukraine more. And then number two, they've only delivered, particularly the big economies like Germany, France, Italy, a fraction of what the U.S. has. We're still the big dog. And a fraction. Man. Oh, I mean, we have, we've delivered double mm. than what all of the European countries combined in terms of military aid. That's not fair. That's not burden sharing. Uh, and this can't continue to be on the backs of the American taxpayer. I want to ask you about Kevin McCarthy getting very frustrated, obviously, in this meeting today. It's been widely reported. Uh, he used a stronger F word than frustration to discuss, yeah. you know, the motion to vacate the threats against him. Uh, we in the press, I think, are very interested in the idea that somebody's going to come from McCarthy, that he's going to get ousted from the chair. How real do you think the possibility is that he faces that vote? Or is it bluster from his more vocal opponents. Yeah, look, I think you're seeing people throw that out there, but I don't see anybody wanting to step into that very, very difficult position. I think McCarthy is doing uh, with a very slim majority. And oh, by the way, Garrett, we have people that are out sick. Mm -hmm. We have people that are having children. Some people are getting surgeries. So an all, uh, a narrow majority is even more narrow. And he is, he is uh, doing the best that I think anybody could do. I want to ask you about impeachment. You've been around for a couple of these now. Yeah. We're about to potentially go down our third. You put out a statement in 2019 mm -hmm. in the first Donald Trump impeachment that sounds like it could have been written today. Mm -hmm. This process will continue to be unfair and a major distraction from tackling America's problems. Health is still too expensive. Our roads aren't being fixed. Our military currently, when you put this statement out, only has 19 days of funding left. We owe it to the American people to do better. Today, the military has fewer than 19 days yeah. of funding left. Does what you said then still apply now? Well, look, uh, in terms of a vote on impeachment, if that's what you're getting towards. Was this the right use of the House's time and energy? In I this think moment? we have such an avalanche of ev evidence at this point, Garrett. I mean, we have multiple whistleblowers, two of which are self-described Democrats and civil servants that are coming out of the woodwork saying they were obstructed in their investigation of whether Joe Biden and Hunter Biden paid their taxes. We're not going to ignore those folks. Uh, we're, we are requesting documents that an inquiry gives us greater standing on. When you have, when you have the president of the United States repeatedly lying to the American people about Hunter Biden collecting from China, which he then contradicted well, in court well, when yeah, he's well, lying. Lying to the American people is not a crime. It's not even it's right. common so, for presidents of the so United States. So on the one hand, he's saying I have nothing to do with it. Now we know from Hunter Biden's business partners and from these whistleblowers and from a credible informant that perhaps he directly 
collected. I don't know what vice president needs 20 shell companies, well, suspicious activity reports, money from nefarious uh, individuals. We're not entering articles of impeachment right now. We're saying we need greater standing in an investigation, and we have a responsibility well, to get to the bottom if, of it. If that, if that evidence is so strong, why not have the vote to authorize the inquiry? Why not take the next step rather than have Kevin McCarthy just announce it unilaterally? Well, look, I think that that cat was out of the bag uh, with, with Nancy Pelosi. She set the precedent, and, and now we're moving forward. And ultimately did I mean, hold a vote. Harry Reid, well, and we may still. We may still do you think, uh, do you hold think a you vote. Should, there's a huge segment of the American people who thinks everything you just said about Hunter and Joe Biden is basically BS. Does having a vote on the House floor to formalize this give your probe more credibility with people who think this is just more talk from Republicans? They've been doing oh, this no, for nine I think months. people I think people that are waving that away and frankly, with a large section of the media that's barely even covering it. I mean, the Devin Archer testimony got almost no coverage outside of a few networks. Uh, when you have the business partner of the son of the president saying, oh, no, repeatedly, the vice president of the United States as the sitting vice president was on the phone with oligarchs, had dinner with them, was directly engaged in the business. And then you have civil servants, longstanding civil servants, self-described Democrats saying they were obstructed in looking at tax evasion and foreign lobbying and an influence peddling as a sitting vice president. I think we have an obligation to look into it. If, and anyone who is saying that's BS isn't actually reading the 150 suspicious activity reports we, 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 and we, looking at the 20 shell companies that are registered look, to I think, members of the I think family. All, I think we're all going to get a chance to look at this evidence going forward as it exists. And one important thing, Guys, it's all up on the website yeah. and it's not being done in a compartmented, secured facility in the dark. Yeah, was, Everything that we have is out there I, for everybody I covered to read. that impeachment, believe me. <laughs> I remember that facility far better than I'd like to. Congressman, yeah. We have to leave it there. I hope you'll come back and talk about this more as it gets going because will I think do. it will be very interesting. Congressman Mike Wallace from Florida, Thanks. thank you very much. And up next, the vice president hits the trail trying to fire up young voters to back Biden's reelection amid growing concerns about his age and ability to serve a second term. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Joining me now is my panel, Jeff Mason, Reuters White House correspondent, Rana Epting, executive director at Move On, and former Republican congressman from Pennsylvania, Charlie Dent. Um, Rana, I got to start with you. You just heard that conversation with Mike Waltz from an organization founded on the principle of moving on from impeachment charges. Um, what do you make of this argument? Republicans seem to think they are much further along in this process than I think the rest of the country thinks they are. How deep does the rabbit hole go with this impeachment? Uh, unfortunately, it feels never ending. I mean, Republicans have been on, we're going to impeach Biden beat since day one. Mm -hmm. uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene announced this two days or, or even 24 hours within right. Biden's presidency. So it just seems like this is something they've been gunning for from, from the get-go. Um, but we're seeing in their inquiries this two years uh, J James Comer has been investigating Biden and there's not much to this mm -hmm. so to uh, you know the way I see it we've got a two-year arc of a uh, an investigation that has produced nothing and instead now they're just gonna put it on overdrive launch an impeachment inquiry and they don't seem to have a real plan and and what this really is is they're trying to distract uh, from the, the reality that Trump has 91 indictments and there will be a lot of uh, negative news around him and they're just trying to create a circus. So, Charlie, I'm, a, I'm on the record as saying that I thought Republicans were going to do this at some point, basically from the moment they won the House back, sort of a break glass option when they needed to kind of go a little bit further on these investigations. What's the risk for House Republicans now? And what do, to, to, to the point you just heard about, you know, a distraction either from Trump or for their inability to pass a spending bill, is this, the, is this bread and circuses basically at this point? Well, the real risk is this. There are 18 House Republicans who represent districts that Joe Biden won. And those 18, uh, I think, are most at risk because they're getting hammered right now from their constituents on the right who are saying, you're a rhino, you're a squish, you're a bedwetter, mm -hmm. you don't have the guts to vote for impeachment. They're but getting hit from the left. Many of them have been publicly yeah, supportive but, but so get, far. They're getting hit from the left, too. You're a MAGA Republican. Uh, they're in a bad place. Uh, I know several of them were not prepared to vote for an impeachment inquiry. Right. Uh, that's why it was done the way it was done by the mm -hmm. Speaker. So I think this is a, a miscalculation at this point. I think this is an overreach. 
uh, really, I think, uh, if anything, you know, Biden's problem is, is frankly, it's his age. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of Democrats, like, look, most voters don't want Trump or Biden to run. They think Biden's too old and Trump's too nuts. And, uh, and that's where we are. Uh, so I think they've kind of maybe, they're going to ra help rally Democrats mm -hmm. to Biden's side with this impeachment inquiry. Um, Jeff, on the age question, yeah. the vice president is out today trying to address this issue. There are also are questions about her efficacy. We saw this column from David Ignatius the other day. You saw that? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of people paid attention Made to that. a little bit of news. Well, and I suspect that the guy at the White House who likes to read newspaper columns yeah. did as well. But it speaks about Kamala Harris and this effort to appeal to younger voters or to present a younger face. They write, the Ignatius writes, Harris has many laudable qualities, but the simple fact is that she has failed to gain traction in the country or even within her own party. Biden could encourage a more open vice presidential selection process that could produce a stronger running mate. How strong is the, how, how deep is the concern within the White House about this sort of drumbeat of one or both of these people maybe shouldn't be on the ticket, either for age or effectiveness questions? Joe Biden reads newspaper columns. He He's aware of this piece. Does he care? Does the White House feel like this is a serious thing they need to address? Oh, they absolutely care. I think they're annoyed about it. I think that um, they see a presidency in which President Biden has legit accomplished a lot, legislatively mm. and otherwise, and don't understand why that's not getting more focus when the focus instead is going to his age and her efficacy. I think I was at a fundraiser last night with him in the pool, and he got us all excited towards the end of his otherwise sort of standard remarks when he said, I want to comment on impeachment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and said basically what you guys were just saying, that Marjorie Taylor Greene has wanted to impeach him from day one, mm -hmm. and now he thinks they want to impeach him because they want to shut down the government. But he does not wake up every day thinking about impeachment. He thinks about working for the American people. Mm -hmm. I echo what he just said because I think that's a, it's sort of a, a window into their strategy. They want to show this split screen. Do you, do you think we will hear him talk about impeachment more or about the attacks on Hunter Biden more? From a political argument, you know, we talked in an earlier segment about the ways in which this economic message isn't breaking through. Mm -hmm. But if you can make the contrast that, look, House Republicans are out to get me while I'm doing the work for you, is that a more effective message to acknowledge that more forcefully than it is to pretend like it's not happening? I think I think that's the split screen window that they're looking for. Yes, mm -hmm. I don't think he's going to talk about Hunter more. I no. think he will stay away from that as, as much as he possibly can. But I think he, it's inevitable that he'll have to engage a little bit on impeachment, and he started to last night. Ronald, what do you think? I mean, is this a, is this an opportunity for the White House to present a contrast in the same way they did in the midterms? Of these guys are anti-democratic. They're you know too, far too extreme. While I'm out here doing the work, are they missing that boat by? not putting the principal out there to talk about particularly impeachment more forcefully? I think who's missing the boat is Republicans, to be quite honest. I mean, this is just a continuation of their culture wars, their charades that had them lose in 2020 and resulted in a loss in 2022. I mean, Democrats expanded their margin in the Senate. They didn't lose nearly as many House seats as was predicted. And it's because like, the Republicans seemed to be obsessed mm -hmm. with, um, with resentment politics, with vindication, with revenge, with culture wars. And you have the split screen that Jeff talked about, which is the president and the, and the vice president, president are governing. They're passing bills that help the American people, that reinvest in this economy. And then you have the Republicans on, on the other side, McCarthy being one of them. Mm -hmm listening to everything Donald Trump whispers into his ear, and it's just not meeting the American people where they're at right now. Congressman, the president is apparently going to give a speech probably immediately after the next Republican debate to try to highlight the idea that these Republicans, who the country will have just watched on stage, are a threat to democracy. Is that still an effective argument? And how do the actions of this House Republican majority help the president make that case or undercut it? Well, it's pretty hard to make this kind of a monolithic statement about Republicans all being against uh, democracy. Is it true? Some, some are. Mitt some, Romney seems to think they are. Some are. I mean, I'm not, look, I, I, some are. I'm, I'm not going to dispute that. Uh, but the, the challenge is I think you, you paint with a pretty broad brush, and I don't think that's going to play as well as they, they might think. I think it's a, a decent argument, though, for him to make. I mean, why not? I mean, why not make that argument and talk about the risk of 
the, certainly Trump represents, mm -hmm. uh, and and some of the other Trump wannabes are a, a threat to these institutions. And and so I think it is a strong. I think it is a strong argument. I think a stronger argument, frankly, is abortion. Um, yeah. I, mean, I mean, Republicans have two big problems as far as I can see right now. It's Trump and abortion, um, and it might be abortion and Trump in that order. Yeah, maybe. Uh, th that's and I think that's their big challenge. And if I were Biden, I'd stay there. I mean, you can always throw in the you know the you know, the anti democracy issues, uh, but I think it's the other two that will drive the votes. Jeff, I want to give you a quick last word. We talked about Romney uh, res uh, announcing he's not going to seek re-election. Younger than the president, ideologically finding himself allied with him, another centrist deal maker hanging it up. How does that affect the president's thinking about what he can get done, what he would be facing a second in a second term? We know they spoke. Uh, talk to me about how those two interplay off one another. Well, I think it's it's the loss of somebody who, as a Republican goes, could be an ally mm -hmm. in in the Senate in terms of trying to get things done. I think it's a it's the, it's the type of colleague that Joe Biden would have loved to have worked with when he was in the Senate, mm -hmm. and and you just don't see that many as, anymore. So I think that's a loss for him. I, you know, I, it's not like. Mitt Romney's going out saying, "If I had stayed, I would have given Joe Biden everything he wanted." So, yeah. but it's but it's a it's a transition, and it's it's not a good one for for Biden. He did give him a lot of key votes on some very important bills, though. All right, he we got to we got to leave it there, guys. All right, Jeff, Ron, and Charlie, thank you all, and we'll be back tomorrow with more Meet the Press. Now, and as we mentioned, if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press with Kristen Welker. Tomorrow on this show, we'll have a sneak peek at Kristen's one-on-one -on -one interview with former President Trump. The news continues with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.